Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, and this is the first report out of the Kitchener Waterloo by election for the balance of power in Ontario seat. If the Liberals get it, they'll probably have a majority, and if they don't, they're going to be even. So maybe if I get it, whoa, what changes would that ever be? Well, we start off with me showing up. I was excluded with the other six candidates, and as usual, I take a seat on the stage and I force them to have the police remove me. Uh, unlike any good democracy, they were ready with the police there tonight and I was removed within 10 seconds. Uh, you know, they were protecting democracy from the unwanted candidate. And uh, so after that, you'll see the police take me out and then I'm going to go over the whole debate. And I'm going to make fun of my opponent's ineptitude, chop them up, lacerate them, make fun of their ineptitude. So, it could be a boring two, three hours. It's repetitive because they got no answers and they keep just telling us how much they'd like to do things that are good. And I keep making fun of them in the same repetitive way. So, it's a lot of time, but what can I say? I just decided it was time to put the boots to these people because they went and took my time. I don't know, but I got good coffee. Well, if there's another undemocratic meeting, you guys come and take it. You know, it's my way of resisting. I can't do anything else. You, know? you tell me to leave. When a guy, when a guy with a badge says move, I do. Yeah, but perfect. until then, they got to... All right. So, here we are. We can see how they do politics in Kitchener. Okay, it's a contest of who sign can cover the other guy's sign the most. Imagine. Wow. I mean, what effort, what, what work, what team, you know, what organization to have all these people and all these signs out here. I tell you, that's what a campaign needs in Canada, organization like this, you know. I mean, let's face it, if the grass could vote, they'd all win.
Okay, so now we're going to sit back and enjoy probably the most boring two hours of debate you'll ever hear, except for my commentary, as I roast the guys who took my share of the time. This is a lady who told me to take a seat. election and the logistics of setting up this event, we're focusing on the four parts. All right, we're going to wait and a second, Chuck. We also have many online viewers uh, who joined already coming. to follow the event tonight. They'll be following our live stream All coverage right. at www.therecord.com. Oh, as I go through this, I made up a little chart. And I'm going to note how many times each candidate says, we need to do this, a goal. You know, we have to have that or I believe, but never explain how they want to hit their goal. I'd like to thank the four candidates who are here. I bet you they picked the questions. Here tonight, taking time out of a busy campaign schedule to join us. Thank you very much. There are 10 candidates running in Kitchener-Waterloo, a number that proved difficult for us to accommodate in a live, time-restricted event like tonight. I know, we're going to have a debate tomorrow night with all ten, but these are incompetent journalists. The idea of ten chairs, you know. She can handle four fingers, but ten is way out of her league. <laughs> Due to the timing of the election and the logistics of setting up this event, we're focusing on the four parties that finished in the top four spots for the past three elections in this riding. Okay, so they're going to favor the favorites who already have an edge. We will be covering all candidates in our news coverage of the campaign. And, we and yes, I did send in a statement about the Argentine solution. Let's see if it gets out. We've been running opinion columns from all candidates on our editorial pages. Our moderator tonight is John Rowe, the editorial page editor of the Waterloo Region Record. So, thank you all for coming, and I'm going to turn things over to our moderator, John Rowe. We would ask you if you'd like to pose a question. When the question's open, you can pose a question then. We'd ask you to take a seat now. We're going to proceed with the forum. I've explained our reasons for the... That's right. She's explaining her reasons. She's not competent to handle ten chairs. The way that the forum has been set up, and if you'd like to talk to me after the session, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> she's happy to talk to you after she's cheated you. So thank you very much. We're going to proceed. As I said, I've explained the reasons. I think we'd ask you to take a seat now. Good for her. And we're going to proceed. Excuse me, could we please proceed with the, with the evening now? Can we please proceed with cheating you, lady? <laughs> okay. I take your comments. So thank you. I guess not everybody in the audience is happy at having the minor candidates excluded, being restricted to hearing only the same guys they hear all the time with no answers. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'd like to begin this evening by thanking everyone for coming out to tonight's election forum and by extending a special thank you to our partner, the Conestogas College School of Media and Design. And so they're teaching the kids how to be undemocratic right in the schools. <laughs> Are you going to hire one of these journalism students? Probably. <laughs> 88.3 CJIQ. In just over one week from tonight, voters in the provincial riding of Kitchener-Waterloo will choose a new member of the provincial legislature in a very important by-election. This evening's meeting is designed to help those voters make their choice. Out of the ten candidates, we'll tell you about four. <laughs> Where'd this guy go to school, you know? Okay, it sounds like only the candidate who's been asked the question gets to put in a response, which is what I object to whenever I participate in debates, because all the questions are going to go to the same 
four guys because they got all the clappers in the audience. And so that's why when I'm excluded from a question, I will leave the stage of debate and I'll go down in the audience and I'll make my pitch to them personally while I'm excluded on the stage. So it looks like they're running that part crooked too. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the candidates who are here this evening representing the NDP party. Catherine Fife, the Liberal Party, Eric Davis, the Conservative candidate, Tracy Weiler, and the Green Party candidate, Stacey Danker. We'll now move on to the opening remarks from our candidates, and we'll begin with Catherine Fife. Thank you, and good evening, and thank you for being here tonight. You know, a democracy depends on the participa participation of its citizens, and I thank all of you for attending. I am here tonight essentially because I care about this community, and I want to make a difference. I essentially feel that when you pay it, you, when you work in the community, you pay it forward. And I, this is a lesson that I've tried to teach my children, Aiden and Claire. I also believe. In now, what's interesting is let's is a kind of pay it forward. You pay it forward by doing stuff for people, except we keep track. In real leadership and real experience that delivers. It has been a privilege for me. She has experience that delivers to serve this community for the last nine years as a trustee and as chair of the school board. Over this past decade, I have attended community meetings and school council meetings and graduations, and I know this community very well, primarily because I listen to this community. And, and I must thank this community as well, because they have taught me about the kind of leadership that they value and the kind of advocacy that they expect from their representation. I have the experience of working collaboratively not only in the education sector but with business and with health care. I feel well prepared to take the priorities of Kitchener-Waterloo to Queen's Park. New Democrats and our leader Andrea Horvath have shown that politics can be done differently. We can reach across party lines. We can put people first and we can deliver real results. And we have a plan that focuses on creating jobs, strengthening health care and making life more affordable. We have the momentum in, the, in this election to make a difference. This is a historic by-election and your vote will decide the kind of government that we need and the kind of government that you want and I thank you sincerely for being here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so she's gone to a lot of meetings and she's a good listener and she'll take the priorities to Toronto and uh, she can deliver and she knows about creating jobs without creating paychecks okay now I've always said you have to create paychecks before you can have a job but these are the kind of people looking for jobs without looking for paychecks first <laughs> that's why they never have success right alright next loser Thank you, and we'll move on to hear from Eric Davis. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to first thank you very much all for coming. It is personally very heartwarming to see many people engaged in our local democracy. There are plenty of issues to discuss in detail this evening, but first I want to take a step back and remember why we are all here. We're all here to elect an MPP for Kitchener-Waterloo. Elizabeth Whitmer served our community for 22 years as our MPP. I have a great deal of respect for the dedication that she showed to Kitchener-Waterloo. She invested a great deal of her life to working on our behalf, and we should sincerely thank her for that dedication and commitment here tonight. Give somebody a hand. There's his first I letter. was raised to believe that each of us has a raised responsibility to contribute to the vibrancy and success of our community. 
everyone contributes in their own way. Thus far, my way has been through volunteering with a number of local community organizations, most notably as Vice Chair of the United Way and as former President and Chair of the local branch of the Canadian Mental Health Association. However, I have long believed that public service is an important responsibility and an honor. I looked at former representatives, such as Elizabeth Whitmer, Andrew Tlegde, and Herb Abbott, and I see how our community has benefited from leaders who have been strong local representatives of Kitchener-Waterloo first and foremost. I am putting forward my name to serve as your MPP because I believe in the importance of public service and I want to provide strong local representation for the people of Kitchener-Waterloo while ensuring that our moderate and progressive values are responsibly represented at Queen's Park. I pledge you that if I am elected, I will dedicate myself to protecting our shared values and I will work hard to serve everyone here in Kitchener-Waterloo. Thank you. All right, he's going to work hard to protect our shared values. He wants to remember, spend a minute there. And uh, oh, he's a volunteer, but I guess he never heard of crediting his hours in the time bank like other volunteers in the United States. <laughs> he probably wouldn't catch on anyway. And that's about it. Said nothing absolutely except rhetoric. Oh, they liked it. They liked it. <laughs> Said nothing, but they liked it. Thank you. We'll hear next from Tracy Wanner. I'd like to thank you all for being here this evening. It's a pleasure for me to see so many people involved in the democratic process. My name is Tracy Weiler, and I have the honor... As she sits there with six of her opponents excluded, she's happy with the democratic process. <laughs> ...of being your Ontario PC candidate. I am an experienced businesswoman, currently self-employed, an MBA instructor, a community volunteer, and most importantly, I'm a mom to my two young daughters, Jessica and Alicia. That's supposed to pop. My girls are one of the main reasons why I'm running to be your next MPP. I want to ensure that they have a prosperous future. And sure, and I would be honored too. to advocate and represent on behalf of this community. I'm concerned that the current government's overspending and failed economic policies will deprive our children of the economic opportunities we've had. My parents emigrated to Ontario in the mid-1980s. They chose this province because of the limitless opportunity they knew it would afford my sister and I. And I am so proud to be sitting here before you today. Sadly, the current Ontario bears little resemblance to the province that attracted my parents 26 years ago. But there is hope, there is a better way. The Ontario PCs have put forward a bold and comprehensive plan, a plan. to return Ontario to <laughs> prosperity. In keeping with the PCs' tradition of forward-looking, bold leadership, I will help chart a new, course a new course and ensure that Ontario once again becomes a land of prosperity and opportunity. Okay, so she hasn't got the course charted yet, but if you vote for her, she'll get in there and she'll chart a new course when she finds it. Thank you. <laughs> She has a lot of too. Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from Stacy Danker. Good evening, everyone, and thanks again for coming out. Thanks to the organizers of this great event and to the other candidates that are both represented up here and are brave enough to step forward who haven't been able to be here tonight. And those who are in the audience and are not allowed to participate. She forgot us. I, my name is Stacey Dankard. I'm the candidate for the Green Party of Ontario. I'm a mother um, of two boys, Elliot and Carrie. And I recently received my PhD at the University of, Psycho uh, University of Waterloo in psychology. Now, I can talk a great deal about all of the great uh, platform <laughs> issues that we discuss in our policy. But really why I'm here today is because I'm concerned about the future for my boys. Oh, concerned. That's a good one, too. 
I don't like the way that politics has been going. I've been, I've been frustrated Things with the process. It seems as though uh, the people who we're electing to represent us, in fact, aren't representing the voices, our voices here. Ouch! Uh, Need money, we're broke! Instead, what I'd like to do is look beyond the next electoral cycle. Stop thinking short term and start thinking long term. And start thinking about sustainable solutions to health care, sustainable solutions to... Okay, so she's in favor of starting to think about solutions. He doesn't have one yet, but he's ready to start thinking about it. Education and, and sustainable solutions to uh, the economy. Oh, yeah. And all of that can be done within a fiscally responsible manner. Yes, don't know how, Elizabeth but Whitmer did a, did a fantastic job representing this community for over two decades. And But really, um, what we should be learning from that is that what she did best was to represent the voices of this community at Greens Park, even when it didn't necessarily align with her partisan values. And so that is what I would like to offer to this community, is a voice that is unique to this region, um, that fights for the values and the needs of our community. Thank you very much. Okay, so she wants to represent her voices. Uh, she wants to be a unique voice. And uh, other than that, nothing. So the, the first question tonight for the candidates will come from Waterloo Region record columnist Louisa D'Amato. All right, let's see how bright a question this is going to be. After all, she's a journalism student. Their highest claim to technical ability is tape recorder 101. to all four candidates. The teaching unions have been getting a lot of attention in the news, but really, they are just the tip of the iceberg. In order for spending restraints to have real meaning for Ontario's deficit and its economy, the government must also tackle the issue of public sector remuneration in health care, in firefighting, and in policing. Okay, money missing in all these sectors. Specifically, how would your party handle the broader issue of public sector wages and benefits beyond what is happening with the teachers? Okay, thanks for that question. Now, you know what the Argentines did? They simply printed up, instead of bringing a million dollar bond to a New York bank to get a million in bills, spend it, tax it out with interest, they printed up a million in small denomination peso bonds, spent them, taxed them out, no interest, saved all that money, put everybody back to work. Now let's hear what these candidates got to offer. And of course, I didn't get to offer the Argentine solution. Jim Louisa, the first candidate to have an opportunity to respond will be Eric Davis. Thank you very much. The Ontario Liberal Party has a plan. We have a plan to bring Ontario back into balance by 2017-2018. But our plan is a balanced one. They got a date! Therefore, it must be a workable plan. It makes sure that we can protect the gains we've made in health care and education. In order to do so, we're asking all public sector workers to take a two-year wage freeze. We're doing that because without it, we wouldn't be able to balance the books. Specifically in relation to teachers? Of course, in Argentina, they didn't have to take a wage freeze. They could take their wage raise in bonds. Now, you remember, during the last provincial election, I interviewed a doctor running a midwife clinic in Brantford, and I asked her, would you take Ontario provincial bonds? You can pay for your hydro taxes, medical, and licenses? And she went, of course. Um, we're asking for them as well to take a two-year wage freeze. The Hudak PCs would cut teachers, fire teachers, eliminate full-day kindergarten, and bring to destabilize our school system. They'd be worse. <laughs> We're lousy, but they're worse. <laughs> While the NDP don't have a plan at all, they don't actually have a plan to actually rein in spending and balance the budget while making sure that we protect our investments in health care and education. The Liberal plan is positive, modest, and balanced. And that's what we need going forward in Ontario. Thank you. 
Now, he didn't explain the plan, didn't explain where any money would come from. He just said, we got this magic plan that's going to do this and that and that and that and all these good things. And you know it how many times they're going to say, we have a plan or we have a policy that's going to do. Then they list all the good things they expect their plan to do without ever telling you how. Of course, how is an engineering question, right? Thank you. Tracy Wilder. Thank you. The Progressive Conservative Party is the only party with a plan to deal with our debt, deficit, and return Ontario's economy to prosperity. In fact, the Progressive Conservative Party advocated and put forth legislation this past May to the legislature to promote a wage freeze across the board for all public sector employees. <laughs> Another loser got no money, got a wage freeze. <sighs> and the Liberal government turned that down. That would have enabled us to save $2 billion annually in our goal to turn the economy around, create jobs, and stop the overspending... Create jobs by laying off people. <laughs> ...and waste that the current Liberal government is doing with our precious tax dollars. Thank you. Nobody's laughing. Stacy Danker. I agree that we all need to work together Me to too. deal with the uh, very large issue that the deficit presents to us. However, I think that there are some potential savings that we're missing. For example, if we were to have an open adult conversation about adding uh, fairness and equity into our schools by merging the Catholic and public school boards, then we could be saving $1.5 billion every year. So we need to approach this issue with negotiation, cooperation, and respect. Me too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Catherine Fire. Um, thank she you. wants to approach the issue with respect and cooperation. That's what she'll do. She'll approach it. Very much. Um, let's be very clear about something right now. The uh, wage freeze that the teachers um, are, are accused of not accepting is completely a manufactured crisis that the McGuinty government has put forward on the table. You know, you know what, what works when you're trying to negotiate is actually negotiating, not in the media, not by calling names, you know, adults having a conversation. The wage freeze across the public sector is, is necessary. There is obviously a need for austerity and to find efficiencies. But I must tell you, you should, we should also be concerned about the public sector bonuses, which both the PCs and the Liberals have ignored. There's no way that someone who is making $400,000 should get an $80,000 bonus. And yet they, that's okay, the legislation today. So, Penny Annie stuff. You know, I mean, uh, can't. I'll let's let her finish. Well, let's be very clear. When we're talking about wage freezes, there's more at play in this scenario, and don't buy what they are selling you. All right, don't buy what they're selling you, and uh, she wants an adult conversation about it. <laughs> By the way, teachers are having a rally tomorrow in Toronto at high noon, and I'll be there. My question will be about uh, Highway 7. Uh, Ontario began planning for Highway 7 23 years ago. Uh, the Liberal government approved the new Highway 7 in 2007. We still don't have one. Uh, for all candidates, I guess I have a two-part question. One, uh, why do you feel we need or do not need a new Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph? And two, why is this taking so long? Yeah. Um, Gee, I guess everybody's going to think they need to have a better Highway 7. If he's asking, why is it taking so long? So why ask who's against? They're all going to be for. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Highway 7 is something that the Progressive Conservative Party has been very vocal about. We've been very concerned that the Liberal government Sorry. has uh, broken their word on this promise 
much like many other promises. In 2007, they committed to Highway 7. In 2010, and now, curiously, just before this by-election, they have once again committed to Highway 7. We, we want to make sure that we raise the expectations of the importance and priority of this highway. If I'm elected as your MPP, I will fight for Highway 7 given its importance for safety and capacity, and it will be a personal priority of mine. Okay, vocal concerns. Ah, uh, the liberals are bad. And uh, she's going to fight for Highway 7 and make sure that this important thing happens. Can we talk about Thank you, Stacy Danker. I absolutely agree that we need to provide good connections between right. these cities. We need. I think that the way that we're going about this is something that is about 23 years old. Uh, we need to step into the 21st century and start talking about adding better transit options for people to actually be able to um, move between these two cities efficiently. And that fits nicely within the idea of places to grow. We're no longer disrupting uh, 144 hectares of farmland, wetlands, building a bridge over the Grand, and spending $400 million. So that would be my proposal, is to increase that. Thank you. Her proposal is to increase something. I didn't get what it was, but it wasn't money. Catherine Fife. Thank you very much. You know, it's a little bit like Groundhog Day for me because when I was in, two, in 2007, I was the candidate and the highway was promised at that point in time. We need to be very clear. It's not on the five-year capital uh, projects. That promised by everybody. This is for the Ontario government. It's, it's clearly a by-election promise. And maybe if we have another by-election in another couple of years, it'll come back up again. Uh, you know, we, the NDP, though, we need to see a plan we before need. we make a commitment to it. But it is important because there are some serious safety concerns. And Okay, they don't have a plan, but they know they need a plan. The economy between our two centers has stalled. Uh, that Things said, we need 21st century we thinking need. around this highway. Yes, we we need, need to protect farmlands. Yes, we need we to need. incorporate a conversation around public transit in that in that conversation as well. And that's the NDP's commitment. And I noticed that the PCs have said that this will be a priority, but they walked away from the 2012 budget process, did not participate at all, missed an opportunity to actually engage in a conversation about the highway. That so was bad. let's 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 be honest about what that's that was a missed opportunity for the PCs in this last budget. Thank you. Eric Davis. Highway seven is important to our local economy. Oh, it's yeah. a key artery between Kitchener, Waterloo, Waterloo yes. Region, and as well. Nobody knew that. And I can before. tell you that uh, just speaking to my wife who has to travel it on a regular basis. Um, there's significant congestion there, especially at particular times of the day. But let's not forget the history of Highway 7. When the McGinty Liberals took office in 2003, Highway 7 project had moved nowhere for 14 years. The NDP had a chance to do something, the Tories had a chance to do something, and neither of them did anything. And the Liberals in 2003, we, improved the, we approved the environmental assessment, and we started <clears throat> moving the project forward. Ah, moving we did the necessary forward. studies, we took our time to make sure we got it right, and now we are committed to shovels in the ground in the next three years. It's important for our local economy, and that's why I think that I was very proud to have a firm timeline now on Highway 7 construction. He's happy. Okay, so we have Martin from Waterloo who has a question about democracy for all candidates. Oh, good stuff. Yeah, um... In the candidates' opening statements, I think everybody, all, all four of them, spoke about the democratic process and the importance of it. And I'm wondering how, I'd like to hear their opinion on how they feel about the record blocking out the voices of six of the ten candidates, and even more shameful, having two winter cops here to uh, make sure that they don't speak. Thank you. Uh, the first candidate uh, who 
there's a chance to answer is wow. Stacy Day. On the spot. Yes, and yes. I appreciate that it. This is a very difficult process for difficult for democracy. not only the record but everybody else yeah. here. That um, everybody in this room obviously respects the idea of democracy. The idea, um, yes. and I think that that's one of the great things about where we live yeah. is that we, we respect it. We don't do it. Opportunity to have our voice. Um, her voice. I, I don't really know what to say to you, to be completely honest, um, except that uh, I, I hope that you do get a voice. Um, and, um, but I'll take your time anyway. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not really sure. But, uh, okay. Um, Catherine Fife. She doesn't feel too good about being a cheater. Well, I think that I would agree that if all ten candidates were up here, that it would be a more diverse and wholesome uh, conversation and debate. Uh, clearly, the political spectrum is constantly in flux, and uh, you know oh, that, that is one of the strengths of our democracy. Uh, I do appreciate some of the timelines that the record has issued. Oh, yeah. uh, at the same time, I think that moving forward, certainly ensuring that all voices have an opportunity to be ensuring heard yeah. is important. And in one respect, uh, <laughs> the, the very fact that... As the voices are shut out, she says it's important ensuring that the voices be heard. <laughs> social media is playing such a strong role. Yeah, we can go to the social media, if uh, not all this that, media that here. That is another way for us to improve and grow democracy uh, and the voices of all parties. Thank you. But not by letting them on this debate, by her standing up and saying, I won't participate if the others don't. I've had candidates do that. Bob Mitchell, I remember him. Tory. Graham Bird, Tory. Lowell Green, Liberal. Eric Davis. Never an NDP. I think it's important in any political discussion to include divergent voices. Ah, it's important. But it ain't going to happen. <laughs> All right. It's important to include people who you may disagree with vehemently, who you may, you know, just absolutely uh, disagree with, and whose uh, political viewpoints you uh, you may not uh, you may not hold particularly close to your heart. Um, I understand the time restrictions imposed by the record, I but I think so it's hard. it's always important to include a variety of voices in our democracy. It's that debate, it's the discussion that happens uh, during this process, which I think is so important. And that's why I'm so happy to see the lineups almost out the door for questions there, because it's really important to... What's the lineups out the door for questions got to do with some candidates being excluded? Oh, yes, all candidates should have a voice, but look at the lineup of people ready to ask me questions. <laughs> that's what he's thinking about. Oh. To engage as many people as possible in this process. Except the other candidates. And if you don't have that debate and discussion, um, then, then I think democracy suffers for it. So, okay. I'm, so democracy suffers, but he's not going to help fix it. I would welcome more participation, but I understand okay. the record's position and the time restrictions involved. The time restrictions. What that means is that there's not enough time to give all the candidates a fair share because they want to give the major candidates more. <laughs> That's the time restrictions. We want to give it all to you so there's none left for the other guys. Oh, we understand our time restrictions. <laughs> he understands how the recorder had to exclude us, right? The record. <laughs> Someone's clapping. Hey, babe. Hey. Happy two week anniversary. Oh, commercial. Got to cut it. Thank you. Um, when I learned that all candidates were not to be up on the stage, I was quite surprised. Um, I think it must have been a very difficult decision for the organizers. Yes, how the difficult. Event. They always exclude the little guys. Really <laughs> it's the easy have, decision. Um, a depth of discussion. And I think involving all of the parties in that discussion would have very much added to the diversity of our dialogue. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statements, I came to this country um, as an immigrant. One of my proudest moments was becoming a Canadian citizen so that I could vote and participate in the democracy that we call Canada. And I certainly hope... And now you've got a shameful moment when you participated in an undemocratic debate and cheated your opponents. That through the rest of this by-election, their voices will be heard loud and clear.
but not on this major media event. At all the little private meetings with a hundred clappers in the room and ten neutrals, that's when we're going to get a chance to participate. But not with the everybody watching and listening on radio and TV. We'll get our chance tomorrow, she says. My question is for all of the candidates. Uh, I, the McKinney government uh, has broken so many pro uh, promises uh, to the state of power that I don't know what to believe anymore. Um, why should we trust you? I guess I guess my point would be that you can't. Uh, first of all, but you know, I just like to say that I think that a minority government can work and should work for the people that elected it. And I think that we've seen. I mean, there's a definitely the cynicism that we see in in this in this riding in this by-election proves that there are some serious trust issues, uh, which is why you know New Democrats uh, provide that checks and balance at Queens Park. And uh, certainly a majority is not in the best interest of the province. It's going to take all of the parties working together to make this province a better place and to make this riding truly uh, successful on all fronts. And so uh, I do not support, obviously, uh, a majority, and I don't think it is deserved. And I'm hopeful that the electorate will also find that a majority government is not in their best interest either. Thank you. So why trust her? Because a minority government can work. The McGinty Liberal government has made great strides for this province. Since 2003, uh, if you just look at what we were left with after the Hudak PCs, uh, what, what they did to the province in education and health care, we've rebuilt education totally and health care in this province and have really put a focus on families and making sure that families are given the opportunities necessary. In relation to a minority government in the previous... All right, so he's focusing on families and making sure they're given an opportunity, which they may not be able to take if they haven't applied properly, right? <laughs> ...budget cycle. Let's not forget what the Hudak PCs did. Oh, yeah. They basically bad. went absent. Hudak was absent without Can't leadership. Trust those Tories. He didn't want trust to even me. engage in the budget negotiations. <laughs> uh, before the budget even came out, he already decided he was going to vote against it. Andrea Horvath and the NDP, however, they basically too. broke their word. They we had cut a deal with them, and then twice they went back on that deal. I think what you can look at is the McGinty Liberal government values and how those values are the values of this community and everyday Ontarians. Okay, you can trust him because He's got the real, true Ontario values. <laughs> Can I hear someone laugh too? Tracy Waller. Thank you. Well, one of the things I'm a bit confused at is um, yeah. my opponent says the Hudak government, and I'm not sure that in the past eight years um, the Progressive Conservative Party has been in government. One of the important reasons why I'm running is because of the broken promises. Um, I haven't been in a political position before, I've just been an engaged participant. And I think when you want to see change in a community, you have to be part of that change. And whether you're voting for that change, whether you are leading that change, or if you're participating in the political process, it's important. A minority government in this by-election is critical so that we can continue to provide account and keep the Liberal government accountable for what they are doing to this province. All right, vote for her so she can keep them accountable for the screw-ups they're doing. And when she gets in, they'll be able to keep her accountable for the screw-ups she'll do. The fundamental underlying uh, nature of the Green Party platform stands for public consultation, respect, and negotiation. And that's at the forefront of many of the policies that we have. And the, the beautiful thing about the policies that I can often say is that the policies beautiful are my values, policies. but I don't have to, um, it, it's not difficult to associate with them. And so I would I would like to uh, suggest that perhaps it's time to try a new type, a new government, 
Um, we've seen all of the other governments in action, and I think what you end up with is the status quo, and I think perhaps now it's time to start thinking about change. So, time to try something new. Except that all the really new stuff isn't on the show, and she's the only new. So she can sit there and say, I'm the change. Now what the change is, she hasn't told us, but she's a change. Well, to be honest, I, I actually am not, I must have misspoken. My apologies. I would never want the Hudak PCs to ever form a government. Um, Zinger. I think that was just a nightmare that I might have had the other night. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that the McGinty Liberal government has been an excellent government, has served this community, and has served all of Ontarians well. So, um, if I misspoke, I, I just wanted it's to let you know, opinion. I He's never good. want to see the UDAC PCs ever form a government. Thank They're you. bad. <laughs> yes, good evening. Uh, my question is directed at uh, uh, Ms. Fife. Uh, however, if, if all candidates would be able to quickly respond would be great as well. Uh, question is, uh, Ms. Fife, does your party support a public sector wage freeze? They all said yes. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, you know, what we support is a conversation about wage freezes okay. because you, know, you, you have been freezes. inundated with misinformation <laughs> about who, who has a wage freeze and who doesn't have. And partly that has just been about political game playing on, on the part of the Liberal government. Uh, certainly when, uh, when you're negotiating in the media, that isn't the best place to have a conversation. Uh, wage freezes have been put on the table. They have been part of that negotiation, that conversation. And, uh, you know, I think that if you talk to anyone in the public sector, I mean, uh, obviously those bureau the executive bureaucrats who are still getting bonuses, that needs to be part of the conversation as well. But, that you know, people who work bonus. in the public sector, they're good people. They buy cars, they go to restaurants, they buy houses, and uh, they just want to have a conversation. Legislation is not the answer. In fact, it's going to cost taxpayers more money at the end of the day. So let's, let's you know, get back to the table, let's get the work done, and uh, that's what people of this province should expect of a, a fair negotiations process. Thank you. Okay, so is she in favor or, or not of a wage freeze? She didn't really answer, did she? <laughs> Pretty good duck. Let's see if she gets a lot of applause for the duck. Okay, thanks for that question. Um, the person who posed it suggested it might go to all the candidates, so I'll, I'll take his suggestion and we'll give the other candidates an opportunity to respond to, beginning with Eric Davis. I, As I thought, if I'd have been there, there would have been a ruckus. I'm in, in favor of a public sector wage freeze for two years, as has been proposed by the McGinty Liberal government. But respectfully, I, I don't believe that Ms. Fife answered the question. I want to know whether she and the NDP are in favor of a public sector wage freeze for two years. <laughs> Good question. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, she ducked, he caught her. Give um, Catherine Fife an opportunity. And he's in favor of a wage freeze. At the end of this particular round, so we'll continue with Tracy Water. Well, firstly, I am glad that um, my opponent and I do agree that a public sector wage freeze across the board for all public sector employees is something that is duly needed to help get our province on the track to get our fiscal house in order. As you know, in May, the Progressive Conservative Party put forward legislation for a public sector wage freeze and it was voted down by both the Liberal government and the NDP. They want a wage freeze more than the Liberals. This would help save two billion annually. And just to give you some sense, we are looking in excess of a fifteen point four billion dollar deficit this year alone. We and she's found a way to save two. <laughs> We need to see a change. She didn't tell us what it was, but she said we need a change. <laughs> I would like, uh, in similar vein to what Ms. Fife was saying, to have a conversation with the teachers and enter into this negotiation in good faith. Uh, but I would tend to...
we got no money. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> to agree that we need some level of cooperation, we need, some yes. level of wage freezes, yes, we need that. Um, particularly in those highest earning brackets. Yeah, we need that. And then, of course, I would like to extend that conversation far beyond that to include conversations about what else we could be saving money on. And I think that it is those frontline workers that have a clear idea of what that might be. Um, and I already alluded to the merger between the Catholic and the Public School Board as a big cost-saving technique. Um, and standardized testing might be another um, that saves us an additional $35 million. So, $35 million. Uh, Yeah, I'd like to see some good conversation and um, make sure that we're actually uh, negotiating to keep the quality of education in our schools that we will all want. <laughs> so she wants to keep negotiating to keep the quality there. And lots of conversation. That's what you're going to get out of her. The NDP supports a conversation which is fair and, open and transparent. Fair and conversations. One size does not fit all. What has happened right now in the province of Ontario is that you have legislation that the PCs and the Liberals have put forward which undermines and compromises the collective bargaining process, which in the end is going to cost you more money. So, you know, this myopic view about one wage freeze is not the answer. It needs to be part of a, a holistic view of the economy in this, in this province. Uh, this is not the road to go down. So the wage freeze has to be part of the holistic view. But she really didn't answer the question again, did she? <laughs> My name is Gina Konjarski and I'm a registered physiotherapist and I am one of the 600,000 unemployed Ontarians here in Canada who have been negatively impacted by the Ontario Liberal government. I'm concerned we are facing a huge financial crisis in Ontario. We are being faced with 250 billion debt up to 411 looming, 15 billion deficit and 10.3 billion annual interest on that debt. I don't know about you, that. but that concerns me. The Kitchener-Waterloo residents should be concerned as well. It means less money for the things that are important to you. Health care, education, and job creation for the 20,000 that are unemployed. All right. Need money for job creation. Could my, you question is, question, my question is, is, given the past nightmare for the past four years for myself under the Dalton-McGuinty government, what would each of the candidates do to rein in spending and bring fiscal responsibility, which has been sorely lacking under the Liberal government? Thank you. Okay, thank you. She wants to rein in spending and cut jobs even more. Well, let me say this. I agree with you that the deficit is something we need to tackle. Mm. That's why the McGinty Liberal government has a plan to do just that. Oh, not a plan we have a plan to eliminate the deficit by 2017-2018 <laughs> while protecting the gains we've made in health care and education. And let's not forget where we've come. In 2003, the PCs left us with a $5.6 billion deficit. Tory's bad. We then balanced the books for three consecutive years. In the economic downturn in 2008, we did the same thing that the federal conservative government did. Gotten dead again. Invested in people and infrastructure. Deficit. We had to run a deficit to do so, but that was necessary to make sure that our economy rebounded, and to make sure to protect money. people and protect jobs. And pay the interest we, we made the tough decisions, and right now we're focused on getting Ontario back in the black, and we have a plan to do so. The Tories and the NDP have no plan. They do not have a plan to get us back on track. We do, and that's why we're. That's why uh, the Liberal government is is the responsible choice. They have the plan. Now, he didn't explain how it works, but he said it's going to do a lot of good things, but not how it works. <laughs> Yay! Tracy Wilder. One of the things that I find really troubling about Ontario's debt is that Ontario will double its debt in 2012. She's concerned. A feat that took 23 premiers 136 years to do. Ah, she's only about exponential functions. And that is scary functions. to me. So we need to make some change. We need to reduce the we cost need. and size of government. Yes, we need. The progressive need. conservative government has a plan a to plan. do that. We heard about talking about the public sector wage freeze. Another of our planned ideas oh, is to fix plan. the broken public arbitration system. Ah, fix something. We have committed to reduce government spending oh, outside of our protected critical services in healthcare and education. 
Those are just some of the ideas in our bold plan that will allow us to get our fiscal house back in order. Okay, so they have a plan too. Not how it works, just that it's a plan that's going to do a lot of good things. Just like the Liberals. They both have plans. I agree that the deficit is clearly something that we need to be addressing. Yes, and we, we need do to need address to do. it yeah, we do as need. soon as we possibly can. Yes. Uh, and so one of the things that we're you know talking we about is $1 billion that we borrow so that we can give people uh, rebates, um, subsidize their energy use, essentially. That 10% that you get back that most people don't need um, and benefits the highest users the most um, that costs us a billion dollars that we have to borrow. So that is something that we would like to Cut. refocus only onto those people that actually need it. <laughs> so they're going to need a bureaucracy to sit there and fill out the forms and see which people actually need the energy subsidy and which don't. With a whole new bureaucracy to make those decisions. Another, of course, I alluded to the $1.5 billion for our school merger, but then a lot of shifting is smarter spending. Things like promoting health care, which is less expensive than actually trying to treat sick people. Um, and to create more jobs, because as we know, that if you... If you had some paychecks, you could create more jobs. So she's in favor of creating more jobs. We need to, but she just doesn't have any paychecks. <laughs> But she knows we need to create more jobs. If you can build the number Hopefully. of jobs that you have locally, then all of that money is going into Yes, if you can just create jobs locally, all that money. Oh, you need paychecks locally. Oh, Thank wow. you. Well, you know, the Liberals have worked very, very hard at creating this $15 billion deficit. Oh. And uh, we, we have a strong plan to put to address the deficit oh. uh, by 2017-2018. Right. One is plan to cause two. the corporate tax giveaways that do not create jobs. Cuts! And that do not create jobs. In fact, uh, the Bank of Canada's Mark Carney just described that $56 billion as dead money. That's your... And of course, she'll have a bureaucracy to decide too. Your money, it's my money. It didn't create jobs. It was a waste. Uh, we have the fairness tax for the richest Ontarians. We were able to accomplish that in a minority setting. Oh, we got that accomplished. Uh, we bring the priorities of, of unemployed Ontarians to that conversation. The she brought the priorities of unemployed Ontarians to the conversation. <laughs> what was the result of the conversation, lady? Any solution for those unemployed people? Duh. Liberals are now taking credit for it. That's fine. Uh, we also, I mean, we will not stabilize the economy without a job creation strategy. And the Liberals took credit for bringing the conversation, the issue to the conversation. They got a job creation strategy, I heard you say. Investing in small and medium-sized businesses with our... Ah, investing! With, where'd she get the money? <laughs> with our job creation tax credit is strategic and ah. it will do the job. I thought tax credits for job creation is an old meth method that's been used a long time ago. It never worked. Who has a question about bonuses to the public sector? And it's just directed towards Tracy Weiler. Ah, just towards one candidate. I've read that last year 98% of the public sector executives received a bonus. Um, I've also read that Andrea Horvath thinks that this is wrong and is trying to do something about it. Bonus. And so far, Mr. McGinty is not going along with Nickel it. Nickel dimers. Um, the PCs talk about wage freeze. What about you and Mr. Hudak? Would you go along with Andrea Horvath and try to eliminate these bonuses? Um, she hates the bonuses. You know, from my business experience, let me tell you a little bit about bonuses. The first thing, when you're in a business environment and looking at bonuses for your employees, you look at two scenarios. Number one, can we afford it? And number two, has there been exceptional performance? So no, we would not support bonuses uh, for the 98%, and the reason is clear. Number one, our province in a 15.4 deficit situation cannot afford it. The answer is clear. 
and it is highly statistically unlikely that 98% of any population could have exceptional performance. Thank you. Um, I think it's an important question, and so I'd like to um, give the other candidates an opportunity to respond also, beginning with Stacy Danker. Well, this is a bad I do believe we'll cut that, uh, that this is not the time for giving excessive bonuses. No money for bonuses. Um, there are some circumstances in which you might consider uh, some incentives for improved incentives behavior, but bonuses. I think that within the next two years, if we're asking the frontline workers to take wage freezes, then these types of bonuses should be halted. As was mentioned, Andrea Horvath did introduce a private member's bill last Monday uh, to ban uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, executive bonuses. Uh, to date, uh, Mr. Hudak or Mr. McGinty have failed to indicate whether or not they would uh, support that. Uh, given the legislation that was introduced today, it is not part of the conversation. Uh, and you know, it's really unfortunate because we have um, public sector health workers, uh, health executives who are who are getting hundreds of thousand dollars worth of bonuses, and you know where that money could be better spent. So at the end of the day, um, it, we need a strong response to this. That, those are the kind of austerity measures that we fully support. And uh, I hope that Mr. Hudak and Mr. McGinty will come to their senses and support a ban on corporate, bureaucratic corporate bonuses. Thank you. Now, you notice they never mention how much you've added up to. Okay? How much do these bonuses to the 1 or 2 percent of the top executives really add up to compared to the 12 billion dollar, 12,000 million dollar deficit? Probably not much. That's why I call them nickel dimers. Eric Davis. Oh, everybody's against bonuses. Let's not forget the Easy history victims. of pay for, pay for performance, or these bonuses that are being referred to. It was actually brought in by the previous conservative government before the liberals even came into office. They did it. But let's talk Two. about what the liberals did. We froze pay for senior management and cut performance pay by 34%, saving $16 million over the last two years. And we've also asked... $16 million compared to the $12,000 million deficit. $16 million. What a score! <laughs> Nickel diamond. Finance Minister <laughs> Dwight Duncan to look into this issue. It is a serious issue. We're in tough economic times. We're asking all public sector workers to take a two-year wage freeze. Oh, that $16 million was 33%. So I guess 100% would be about $50 million <laughs> compared to $12,000 million. <laughs> now we know the number, I guess. 50 million, right? That's what they're making all the noise about. A lousy stinking 50 compared to a deficit of 12,000. Because we need to balance the budget yes, by 2017-2018. Mm -hmm. It's important to do so important. to make sure Ontario econ Ontario's economy gets back on track. That's the Liberal government record. We need to do this to get it back on track. That's our record. And yet we're not back on track. <laughs> we, we have Lo Ming from Toronto asking about job creation. <laughs> Without any money creation. <laughs> Let's hear the question. Okay, well, I used to live in Kitchener uh, about 20 years ago. So, but I'm here today because we all know that this by-election is actually going to affect all of Ontario, not just Kitchener-Waterloo. So that's why I'm here. And I, too, am actually very, very concerned, okay, about the situation here in Ontario. We've been hearing scandal after scandal, okay, in the news about the Liberal government. We've heard about the $2 billion e-health scandal, the orange scandal where whistleblowers are actually being silenced and intimidated, as well as the $190 okay. million... No, uh, thanks. Uh, could, uh, you, uh, could you put your question to the candidates, please? Thanks. My question is, with, with 600,000 people unemployed and out of work, with 21,000 of which are in Kitchener-Waterloo, what are you going to do about creating jobs in Ontario? Okay, thank you. Okay, now they're going to talk about creating jobs without creating any new money, okay? They got no new chips, but now they're going to explain how much they really want to create jobs. and They have a plan, no doubt, to create jobs. They'll just not tell you how it works. 
I'll tell you how it works, how my printing presses will work. <laughs> we'll turn first to Stacy Danker. All right, dodge and dance, lady. So we, we know now What's that the important? primary job givers are some, coming from small and medium-sized jobs. Oh, and so this is where we really need to focus. Oh, yeah, we need to and focus. And the added bonus to this is that those jobs are actually re-contributing to our local economy. Jobs are good. And so what we would like to do is, is to decrease the taxes that we pay for jobs and for income and, and move those taxes onto things that we don't want to have and that is pollution and wasteful resource use. Take from here. Take uh, and there. so that would start to um, build the opportunities for employers to actually create new jobs. Okay, so the only way the Greens can ever finance anything is by cutting somebody else's funds. We'd also like to give extra incentives oh, to create like clean too, jobs. Mm -hmm. We're perfectly poised with uh, this have to technological hub in Kitchener-Waterloo to create uh, to incentivize people to create more clean jobs and build a strong... So, without any money, you're going to incentivize people to create more new jobs without any money. But the incentives will be there. Okay. Hub, hub of clean technology here, moving beyond what we have already. Uh, she wants to move beyond what we already have. Catherine Fire for the question and of course it's an emotional issue people need to work the only way that we are going to stabilize our economy and address our deficit if people get jobs real jobs not part-time low-paying jobs okay so we need good jobs she knows this vote for her uh, Good the NDP have a strong plan. We have uh, our, uh, we have a strategy yes, around job creator plan. tax credits. So it's very simple. Specifically, strategy, specifically focused on small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, if you create a job, you get a tax credit. We've met locally with the Accelerator Center and, and local Been businesses. Been there, done that. They're extremely receptive to the idea because they need the help and they want to hire people. So why not apply a strategy that has proven to be successful? In the past, it's proven not to be successful. Actually, many people complained about the abuses with the companies who are collecting all these dollars for creating the jobs, and they're not really creating the good jobs. And she's calling that a success. Never worked before, lady. Uh, we could we could get this done as soon as possible. I mean, in a minority setting, if I'm elected, it'll be one of the focus that I bring forward in the next 2013 budget. Uh, but it can actually great. happen now. That's the sad part, is that it's what a missed opportunity in this province. Uh, Eric Davis. Hey, jobs. <clears throat> jobs are important. It's important because yes. you need jobs yes, in order to do the, even the most basic things yeah, we need and take care of your family. Yeah. But let's look at what's been going on. Since 2009, Ontario has created 350,000 net new jobs. McDonald's. We're also proposing a southwestern jobs Gyms. a southwestern jobs fund, a fund focused on southwestern Ontario. A fund. That's something that the Hudak PCs oppose. They're against having a southwestern jobs fund, and we're jobs trying to do that fund. in order to create more jobs in southwestern Ontario, especially in hard hit areas. That's going to be key, because we need to make sure that we grow the economy, we create jobs, especially here in Kitchener-Waterloo. That's why we're investing heavily in post-secondary education in the high-tech sector to continue to create jobs here, right here at home. You know, I think people can talk about losing a job being an emotional um, experience. I think we can talk about the 600,000 people that are currently out of work in Ontario. But unless you've really experienced it, and you've sat around your own yeah, table sharing with your spouse that you've left your job or you've lost your job, it's hard to no really understand it. Yeah. And I'm telling you that because I was somebody that lost my own job about a year and a half ago due to this huge, difficult situation that Ontario is facing, the hard economic situation. And I know what it feels like to try and make your dollars stretch. The PC government is trying to create an environment that will allow us to grow the economy, create jobs, or potentially enable a person to become an entrepreneur. Okay, so they want to create an environment where things will grow. Now, how do you create this environment, lady? Duh. 
like I was able to do. We have ideas to balance the budget to reduce the size and cost of government and treat affordable energy as another idea of the cornerstone of economic growth. Yes, wouldn't affordable energy be nice as a cornerstone of growth? Now, why can't we afford it now? We ain't got the money. <laughs> but it would be nice as a cornerstone in her imaginary building. Where do the candidates stand on full-day kindergarten? Some say it's too expensive. Some say it's a great program worth every penny. What is your position? They all want okay, thank it. You. It's uh, good. You should we have it. First to Catherine Fife. Watch this. Excellent. Uh, full day kindergarten, very political issue. Um, you know, uh, the NDP supported the uh, the idea and the principles behind the full day kindergarten program. I can tell you firsthand had that, no money it, to do that it. we have seen positive uh, results. Uh, research has confirmed that when you invest early in the lives of children, uh, the, that is a it money works. Well spent. If we only had some money. It has the capacity to change public education. Uh, what we have seen, though, is uh, the program wasn't fully costed out, so some boards are experiencing some difficulties on that issue. Uh, Mr. Hudak has said that he would uh, pull the plug on the program. Right now, 50% of the students have access to this wonderful program. Mr. Hudak wants to, st wants to stop the program altogether. So 50% of the kids in public education have access to it, and 50% wouldn't. Clearly, he does not understand the basic principles of, of investing and supporting public education, which is equality and equity, and that would fail our students. That would be a good place to invest if they had your money. Eric David. Oh, we'll take it from over there. This really hits Tax the rich. I uh, have a two-year-old daughter, Isabella, and I want to make sure that yes. she gets the best education. I should have made sure I can, you know, and a category. I think early learning is setting not only her but every child up for success. Good. It's setting them up for success now and later on in life. Ra, ra, ra. And that's really important. And that's why I'm so proud of the McGinty Liberal government bringing in full day kindergarten. I mean, it's so important to have our kids learn early, set themselves up for success, and it also helps families who may be struggling save over $6,000 every single year on childcare. This is such an important investment in our children, in our grandchildren, in an Ontario's future, and I am shocked that Hudak and, and Tracy Weiler are in favor of eliminating full-day kindergarten. Thank you. I'm going to defer to my personal experience for this question. Um, those of you that know me know that I am very committed to early learning and early education. Um, this past June, I just finished my term of uh, four years as the board chair of the Ontario Early Years, Our Place Early Years Centre in Kitchener. So early learning, early intervention is something I am very committed to and understand the value of it. The program as implemented in full day kindergarten is very expensive in light of our current economic situation. Our question is not a matter of whether full day kindergarten is good or bad, or whether it should be implemented. It's whether we can afford it. We got no money. But it's really about when and how. Okay, so it's about when and how. We know that the best predictors of later success are investing in quality education early on. So I do agree, and I have a five-year-old, so um, I have we haven't been able to take advantage of the everyday all day Gee, why not? Unfortunately. But I've seen other children who have, and I know that it can really benefit them. And what I'd like to so see good. even beyond that oh, is addressing even earlier than that and helping parents with those child care costs that were alluded to before and making sure that everybody has that type of opportunity making as well. Sure. Um, and because this is another stage in that growth, an important stage for our children. It's important. She can't afford it, but she wants to go beyond it. Earlier years is what she wants. Now, she can't pay for either, but she wants even earlier than the others. Vote for her. She wants better than the others. We have Dan from Waterloo who has a question about small business and technical innovation. Ah, he needs money too. 
Okay, my uh, question is for all candidates. It's kind of already been alluded to, but I really want to know specifically what parties are going to do to allow technical innovation in our region. It's our strength, and it's really going to be the economic future of Ontario. And they're all going to allow it. What are the parties looking to do to help small business innovators uh, create jobs and grow? Oh, help create jobs again. Same question as okay, before. Okay, we'll go first to Probably Eric same answers. Davis. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, recently, I had the opportunity to visit the Accelerator Centre, both with uh, Minister Brad Duguid and the Minister of Finance. And it is amazing what is going on in Waterloo Region. It is amazing that in Waterloo Region, locally, we are creating one new tech startup every single day. That is remarkable. And what we need to do, and what the McGinty Liberal Government has done, is invest in that innovation. And let's look at the investments we've made. Let's look at the investments we've made to encourage innovation locally by institutions: the Institute for Quantum Computing, the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, uh, the Global Innovation Exchange, New at Laurier, the Center for International Governance money. Innovation. There's a lot of new uh, investments that choices. the McGinty Liberal Government has made right here in Kitchener-Waterloo to encourage innovation. We need to continue to do so because we need to continue to create jobs and diversify our local economy, especially that. our technical sector. We need that, all right. Yeah. Certainly knows what we need. Tracy Weiler. Thank you for the question. Tell us what we need, I lady. think that innovation and creativity in our region is something that has enabled our community to be successful. Wow, I wow, like wow. it to one of the key ingredients yeah. in our secret sauce that has enabled us to yes. be successful. One of the courses that I've had the pleasure of teaching at Wilfrid Laurier in the MBA program is creativity and innovation in intra and entrepreneurial environments. Wow. Looking at the opportunity for enabling creativity both in the individual setting, the team setting. Looking at the opportunity for enabling. In an organizational setting. I think the PC Jobs Plan really builds on the foundation of innovation and creativity. For example, one of our ideas is to modernize the apprenticeship system to create 200,000 new skilled trade jobs. We All they got to do is modernize and they'll get 200,000 new jobs without any new money created. No new paychecks, but just modernize. Always need to look for innovation and creativity in our environments in order to grow. All right, we must look to grow. So some of the ideas that we come here with are things such as lowering payroll taxes, lowering exemption rates for uh, small and medium-sized businesses so that they... We By taxing the rich. It's already ...to make left. it easier for them to hire more people. We'd also like to give tax exemptions to, um, or tax credits for people who are engaging in, in clean technology site in yeah, our clean yeah. technology sector. We've got good we reasons for using great, the government money um, too. Business here already, Enermodal, that is the top in its field in clean energy sec in the clean energy sector, and so we can really build upon that in the technological base that we already have here. Um, as well, we'd like to expand on apprenticeship programs so that we can make sure to have well-qualified people who are able to do all of the types of installations and whatnot that we need within that sector so that we have a really well-developed and well-rounded system. Yes, we need to expand those apprenticeship programs. We certainly do need to so it'll do this and it'll ensure this. Oh, we really need it. We do have um, some really good things happening in, in the riding, and the Accelerator Center wow, wow, has wow. already been mentioned. Uh, we, the NDP, though, does have a, a plan strategically, strategically directed to small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. Plan, it's our too. job creator tax credit. Very simple. Tax create credit. a job, get a tax credit. Uh, our feedback on that has been very positive. But you know, we also have to talk about the affordability of... Isn't it amazing none of these parties ever thought of tax credits before? New ideas for these problems we're suffering. Tax credits. <laughs> Doing business in the, in the province all of, them, of Ontario. All of them. Heat and hydro, the impact of the HST. You know, it Big is hard bad. to keep the cost of your heat and hydro oh, down when yeah. you're cancelling gas plants mid construction oh, at a cost yeah. of $190 million. Yeah, things are bad. So, you know, if we're, if we're going to have an honest conversation about fostering innovation, then it should actually start at the government's. Okay, conversation about fostering. 
That's what we need. Government side, and uh, clearly there is room for improvement on that. Oh, yeah. Okay, there's room for improvement, you know. That'll create jobs. Thank you. Uh, I think we have another question from Spencer's microphone. All right, give me another fun one. We have Sue from Kitchener asking about accessibility. No money. It's, uh, I'm uh, on here on behalf of the AODA Alliance, which is uh, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Uh, and the McGinty government brought it in in 2000, and we have four acts that are through now, and we're waiting for the fifth one to come through. And we would like a promise from all of the candidates that if elected or when elected, uh, they will ask for uh, additional information, such as uh, education, uh, health, and that's health care and um, residential. So if you could do that. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, I think that accessibility for all Ontarios is a, Ontarians is a critical element in providing a society that I want to live in. Um, I had the fortunate experience of learning more about the Act in my previous uh, business roles and also in my role at Laurier as an instructor. Um, I look forward to learning more about the legislation and definitely is something that I would support and ensure would be a priority um, if I was elected as your next MPP. Um, absolutely, that's something that, that we believe is a very important part of our society to make sure that people who are living with disabilities can do so with respect and dignity and not have to face so many challenges. Good, yeah. um, and one of the better. things that was mentioned there that I think is really pivotal is, is providing better education not only to our society but also to um, businesses and how they can help to make their business more accessible to to um, their employees and other people coming in. More conversation, yeah. I mean, the uh, AOA, AODA standards, uh, when they did come in, I mean, they were well received. You know, what organizations wouldn't want to ensure that, you know, we make progress around accessibility, around education and, and access. However, it is ironic... Well, what corporations wouldn't want to ensure well, the ones who don't have any money to spare. I think, though, that these standards were brought in by the McGinty government. Uh, yeah, I have my personal experiences uh, from the school board's perspective without any funding. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, changing uh, and increasing your capital uh, projects, you know, ramps don't build themselves. So we, uh, we have pushed back, uh, uh, the well, school boards had pushed back in the education sector to say, you know, of course, education key to accessibility issues, but, no but you know, it doesn't happen on a wing and a prayer here, and so put, the, put some money and some funding into the infrastructure that needs to happen across this province. All right, so it needs and money to do it. Eric Davis. When I went door to door, I happened to cross a particular apartment building where I spoke to a woman, and she happened to be in a wheelchair, and one of the things she said to me was is that she was so happy... Oh that the, the McGinty Liberal. Liberal government had brought in these new accessibility rules and regulations. Because it's important to ensure that we have accessible uh, buildings and public services to make sure that all Ontarians, regardless of uh, any disability, can access them. And that's really important. I don't share uh, the view of some that, uh, that you know, you have to provide funding along with it, I think what we need to do is we need to make sure that we make the changes necessary to make sure that these make services sure, are sure, accessible. Make sure. Thanks. <laughs> so all we got to do is make sure, and it'll be made sure. God, what a... And no funding, though. <laughs> no funding, so make sure without any funding. Okay, Marissa, do you have a question? Yes, this is Brendan from Waterloo with a question about unions. Oh, fun stuff. Hi, um, I'm listening to the debate tonight, and, and to me it's strange that only now does the Liberal government support a public sector wage freeze for some public sector workers. Um, and I'm curious for, from the candidates uh, what your thoughts are on the hypocrisy of the Liberal government supporting a public sector wage freeze for teachers, and yet opposing one for a union that supports them politically like firefighters. 
time for the question. We'll turn first to Stacey Danker. I think that um, what we need to refocus on is not necessarily having a battle between unions and not unions. I was speaking with a woman at a door well, and she said to me, not. all of a sudden it seems that if you have a decent paying job and a pension, you're a criminal. Um, and I think that that rang true a bit for me. Uh, and so I think that really we shouldn't be focusing on, on one group only or over another necessarily, but that we should be all working together to make sure that we we're should. making smart we spending should. decisions that benefit us best we over the sure long term smart. rather than just through to the next electoral cycle. We should make sure we make smart decisions. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, it yeah, is hypocritical of the McGuinty government now to start playing hardball with uh, with Labour when, when we're quite honestly, you know, the good relationships that the various Labour unions have had with the McGuinty government has really just uh, disappeared. Remember Bob Ray days? <laughs> all because of a by-election. And that is my firm belief that this is a manufactured crisis to gain a majority government from the McGuinty government. So, you know, it's, it's, you know it, it's hard because, I mean, clearly Mr. McGuinty is more interested in getting seats in the legislature than the, than the seats that our students fill in. He's legislated people back to work when they haven't left work. And, you know, if I were... <laughs> You know, if I were the firefighters and if I were the police, I'd be taking note because the rules of collective bargaining are shifting and changing based on the political will of one party. And everyone should be concerned about that because the power does corrupt and we are watching it firsthand in the legislature in Ontario. Let's oh, here he comes, his answer. get the facts straight. We've been at the negotiating table since December of last year, trying to negotiate with teachers and making sure that we, that we can reach agreements prior to the school year starting. And we've reached agreements with two of the four public sector unions. We've been at the table and we have been negotiating in good faith. We've been doing so because we need to balance the budget. We cannot afford the increases in teacher salaries and teachers' benefits, such as sick days, that will come forward as of August 31st. We need to make sure that we balance the budget by 2017-2018. It's important for us to do so. It's the responsible thing to do. And the NDP will just sit there and they don't have a plan to do anything. And in fact, they don't even have a stand on public sector compensation freezes. The progressive conservative record here is very clear. Um, we are committed to a public sector wage freeze across the board. We introduced legislation as noted before in May and it was turned down, um, voted down by both the Liberal government and the NDPs. We support a wage freeze across the board. We think that is fair and that would include um, all public sector employees including M MPPs. Um, I do think with result to the labour force, um, we do believe that our labour force needs to evolve from the 1940s um, to the 21st century and we do believe some uh, innovative changes are required on that front. Alright, so <clears throat> we need some evolution on that front and she's in favour of wage freezes across the board because she doesn't have any money. And that's what the Tories keep saying, wage freezes because they got no money. We have Sharon from Waterloo asking about values. Values, oh, real concrete stuff. Hi, good evening. Um, my question is for Tracy. Who has better values? Well, Tracy, we know that in a parliamentary democracy, a vote for you is a vote for your leader, Tim Huda. And this evening, in your opening remarks, you spoke about leadership. So I think it would be appropriate to take a look at uh, Tim Hudak's record. Uh, Tim has been a supporter of Can Canadians for George Bush. When he was the minister, the junior minister of health in Mike Harris's government, he closed 28 hospitals and fired 6,000 nurses. Excuse me, could okay. you get yep. to your question, please? I will. So, Tracy, clearly Mr. Hudak is a very conservative conservative. Do you share Mr. Hudak's right-wing conservative values, and do you support Mr. Hudak's right-wing conservative agenda? Thank you for your question. Um, I'm not going to sit here and defend Tim Hudak. This is not a general election. 
I think that what voters need to understand is need. that we are here to promote a local representative that will be your next MPP. This is about who will best be your local leader to represent Kitchener-Waterloo in the legislature. And I am very proud to have been chosen by the Progressive Conservative Party to follow in the footsteps of Elizabeth Whitmer. I am very ready to work hard and would be honored to take that job on. I would work hard, be accountable, work to be trusted, and work with integrity. Thank you. I am a candidate, so I've whistled my way into the, into the party. He's not moving, so I guess I'll be able to ask him a question. The Liberal Party, uh, they're was he looking for the police to come and take him away too? <laughs> plan to balance or to get out of debt, to uh, get out of deficit by 2018, was based on forecasts from last November, which have deteriorated significantly in the meantime. And uh, along with the European crisis and the fiscal cliff that we're facing in the U.S., it would appear that the 2018 embarrassing target is unattainable. Would any of you consider as an alternative to piling tens of billions of dollars debt on our children? Would you consider increasing, restoring the 2% uh, GST cut? <laughs> okay, thanks for the question. Um, we'll turn first to Catherine uh. Pryor. Splashing in the pool, well, taking from here and putting over there. Federal uh, tax. Um, you know, but I think that there, I mean, what we have tried to do, though, is we're, we're working very hard with the, in the current minority setting to make life more affordable for families and for Ontarians. I mean, the HST on home uh, heating, for instance, sometimes runs up to $1,500 for families. Wow. Uh, so uh, we need to look at the tax yeah, structure, and that is why we brought the percent it. increase for those people who make over $500,000. I mean, that A goes directly to the deficit and, and to some programming, like saving childcare spaces. So there are strategies at, uh, there are strategies at play to actually address the taxation structure. We do need a rethink on it. Uh, the corporate tax giveaways, though, are going, they're not going to job creation. They're going into the profit margins of, of large companies. And that's your money and my money, and that is not a good use of it. Uh, I just want to address the, the previous question quickly, if I may. Um, I just want to say that I, 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 agree. I, I, I wouldn't want to be in Miss Weiler's place. I also could not defend Tim Hudak. Um, but I want to I want to basically say that um, that when in relation to taxes, that one of the things that uh, we are not uh, we are not interested in increasing the GST um, in any in any sense of the word. We have a plan. We have a plan to balance the budget by 2017-2018. Um, we have a plan to do so, but not at the expense of health care and education. And that's really important. To make sure that we preserve our values and to make sure... So his plan will do cuts to other people. ...that we do that and, and defend the gains that we have made and not go back to the days of the harris Hudak PCs. Oh, jeez. Thanks. So I think as noted, um, this is a federal tax, but I do think that we are always looking as the Progressive Conservative Party at making life affordable for families. Uh, one of the things that I always have learned, looking. Um, through knocking Never on finding. of doors over the last couple of months and talking with thousands of people is that the residents of Kitchener-Waterloo cannot endure any more taxes. Um, they have been burdened with uh, things like health tax, eco tax, yeah, name a few higher more. hydro rates, yeah. the HST. Yeah. Um, people cannot yeah. afford to have any more fees and taxes placed on them. This is a burden that Ontario families and Kitchener Waterloo residents cannot afford. Gee, I didn't know that. That's news. <laughs> They can't afford it, is our answer? Jeez. Oh, we what definitely do we need? need 
to approach this um, deficit seriously, as yeah. I said before. Um, we need to be looking at uh, more creative long-term solutions um, to shift how we're getting the money, to start thinking about um, taxing the things that we don't want, to give people the opportunity to not have to have such high taxes, um, and stop taxing the things that we do want, like jobs and income. Uh, we need to stop spending a billion dollars on energy need. subsidies that benefit the people that don't need it the most. That's what we need, uh, we need right. to stop thinking about spending $400 million on a road rather than thinking about, um, you know, 21st century solutions Anything to the problem, such as transit. Uh, so I think that we just need to shift yeah. the way that we're spending. We and if, in so doing that, I think then you're... Um, there are many really good solutions there. Oh, yeah. Thank you. One of the things that attracted me to oh. Tim Hudak as the Progressive Conservative leader and the Progressive Conservative Party is that, in my opinion, he is the one leader and we are the one party who has a plan for prosperity. <laughs> the one thing that we are focused on, we are focused on growing our economy, creating jobs, and stopping the overspending and waste that the current McGuinty government is doing with our precious tax dollars. So she wants to do all that without any new money. I think I'm going to change that from political heroes because I understand everyone here admires Elizabeth Whitmer so much it would be too easy a question. So I'd like to ask each, one, each member here that's running who they find is their hero, non-political as well, that it has motivated you, inspired you, and given you values that you would bring to the position. I must say, personally, we have two heroes in this room right now, while the regional police officers who are here to protect and serve, and we need to recognize those two officers. That They're the guys who took away that dangerous candidate who was going to talk about that thing they don't want you to hear about. <laughs> Let's give the cops a hand for protecting us. <laughs> good work they're doing. Good work, good work. <laughs> okay, thank, thanks for the question. Um, Eric Davis. Well, let me speak on a personal note. Um, one of the people that I would consider to be my hero is actually my wife. Oh. And I'll tell you why. Not just because she married me. Um, but I don't know how many of you know this, but at the age of 25, my wife was in the middle of law school and diagnosed with breast cancer. And she stayed in law school through radiation, through chemotherapy, through surgeries. She stayed in law school, she did her bar ends, and she actually took a positive attitude throughout. And she got a job and worked there. And I mean, I can't imagine the level of personal strength that that took. And oh. I just wanted to say that I really um, admire that in my wife, and I think that uh, I think that uh, you know um, I can't think of greater attributes to aspire to. But to survive your cancer. Oh, Tracy Waller. I've often been asked this question, and it doesn't take very much thought for me to answer that my parents are very much my heroes and somebody that I always look up to, um, to learn from and to grow from. At the age of 40, um, leaving everything behind, uh, they immigrated to Canada and started afresh because they thought Ontario was the best place to raise a family. Come on now, Gandhi, Jesus, you know, Gaddafi, real heroes, changed the world. What you set out to achieve. They also have taught me about integrity, accountability, and the importance of standing up for what I believe in. Thank you. The importance of standing up. Stacy Decker. I think... There are many people who have influenced my life pretty heavily, but um, one that comes to mind is my grandfather. He was born in the 1913, uh, I think, and uh, he lived through the Depression. He was a dairy farmer. He was a very hard worker. Um, and uh, I, I always had a great deal of respect 
for him, and he was he was the person who really introduced politics into my life. Believe it or not, we, when I got older, uh, we had quite a number of political discussions. We didn't always meet eye to eye, but he challenged me to think critically about um, what people were doing, and he challenged me to get involved. And so um, I really appreciate that that from you. Catherine Fife. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, uh, my parents inspired me to get political and to get engaged, and so that did that did, has left me with a number of political leaders that I look up to. Uh, certainly, you know, Jack Layton, what he was able to accomplish in this country was. Uh, what well, all he did was finally get elected with uh, the opposition. <laughs> Nothing else I can remember. Poor Jack ever accomplishing. It was quite it was quite astounding. You know that sense of of spirit and optimism. Uh, you know we all said we should legalize marijuana outside of Parliament, but didn't say it inside of Parliament. We need that. That needs to be injected into politics, and and people can do that, and politics can be different, and it should be. But you know, Andrea Horvath, as leader of the Ontario NDP, and Sherry Genovo, and Olivia Chow, and Peggy Nash, strong women who stand up for their communities and work hard. You know, I I have a, I have no problem whatsoever defending my leader. In fact, I look forward to standing shoulder to shoulder with her when uh, in Queens Park. If I'm the lucky, and uh, if you vote for me. Uh, today, while I was trying to decide what to uh, discuss, I was just reading through the newspaper, and I noticed uh, that Tim Hudak today uh, released a white paper called "Path to Prosperity: Flexible Labor Markets." And my question is for you, Ms. Boiler, but I, I'd be willing to hear from any of the other candidates on their views on this. But it looks like Tim Hudek is doing nothing more than unleashing a, an attack on unions, gutting their rights and, and everything they stand for. So I'm just wondering if you currently, uh, do you personally take uh, your position on this? Uh, do you also believe in gutting the rights of the unions? Thank you for the question, and I'm very familiar with the Path to Prosperity, Flexible Labor Markets, White Paper. Um, it has been very well received, and I think that the Progressive Conservative Party has put forward um, some thoughtful, um, potentially helpful suggestions on our province's economic reality. What I would say to you about the white papers is the reason why we publish them is because they are a tool for conversation to embark on dialogue and discussion about how to turn our economy around without any money. and our fiscal house back in order. Without this any is money. a tool for conversation and discussion so that we can develop ideas ah. that will turn Ontario around. Okay, so she hasn't developed any ideas yet, but she wants okay, to. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's an interesting question that I'd like to put to the other candidates too. Um, Stacey Danker. So my understanding of the path to prosperity is that it actually comes from a Republican piece of the same of the same name. Um, Guilt by association. And I think that the old old style way of thinking about these types of changes that we need to make, uh, we've shown over and over haven't worked. And so I think we really need to start thinking about long-term solutions for the difficult start problems thinking. that we're facing. Yeah. Um, and think more creatively. Hey, lady, I started thinking 30 years ago, you know. Come on, you want to start thinking now? While you're running for power, you want to start thinking? Vote for me, I'll start thinking. <laughs> about what, what we need to do, really. To, about what we to need to do. In the right direction. All right. She's ready to start thinking about it. Thank you for the question. Uh, you, you don't cut your way to prosperity. We know that that doesn't work. We just have to look to, to the states to find out what the reality of that philosophy is. And so it is not, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, and it's an old paper. And even if it's just a conversation piece, I mean, 
It's, it's, we need to be having progressive conversations oh, about progressive the economy. The way to do that is to create real jobs, oh, good jobs. Create jobs, uh, that's all. Know, through, uh, for instance, for, through our job creator tax credit. Ah, tax create credits. a job, get a tax credit. It's so simple. It's, and then, and then we How do have that never honest before? conversation of, around uh, the corporate tax giveaways. Uh, you know, that is not money well spent. It is. Oh, it certainly isn't generating any new aren't jobs. They? And this requires a rethink on how government works, oh, uh, and that can happen in a minority setting. It cannot happen in a majority setting. So we need a rethink. What the white paper shows us is the Hudak PC um, view on unions, essentially that they should essentially be kneecapped. That's not the liberal view. The unions are going to kneecap them anyway. Prosperity to Ontario, but what we're doing. But what we're doing is, we're, we're, what we're trying to do from the Liberal government side is we're trying to make sure that we sure. have a balance in Ontario. And in balancing the interests of the unions versus the public, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we can manage Ontario responsibly and fiscally responsibly. That's why we're asking all public sector unions for a two-year wage freeze, because we need to balance the budget and we need to balance the budget by 2017-2018. And so our said plan that to do that before, is responsible. Right? It's middle of the road. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. attacking unions. It's not going after. It's not, not going after. Um, it's not going after them. It's about managing Ontario responsibly. Okay. Thank another you. name. And it's not about unions. Studies. Studies have shown that rather than hauling a heritage building away to the landfill, in most cases. Preserving and retrofitting existing buildings is more beneficial than building new buildings, even highly, new, highly efficient new buildings, in terms of human health, ecosystem quality, resource depletion, and climate change. So, my question is, given that heritage preservation is better for the environment, how will you and your party take a stronger role in enforcing the provisions of the Planning Act, which say, significant cultural resources shall be preserved? This could mean stepping in if municipalities propose demolition of heritage structures or tax incentives for energy efficient retrofitting. So I'd like to know what will your party do to help ensure okay. heritage Thank, Thanks for the question. So I think that's a great question because I think we all do really enjoy having a city that has a certain element of the heritage to it. Uh, and you touched on a great point about the energy efficiency of them. And we would like to see the energy yes. retrofit like program see, yes. come back to Ontario. Um, that is an extremely beneficial program that creates a lot of jobs, saves us energy, which means that we don't have to buy expensive nuclear power plants that we pay for over and over. Um, and we would like to offer tax incentives uh, for like making to. those types of upgrades. So. I absolutely would like to work together with those types of groups to to help to keep that type of heritage within our community uh, and help them to make them more energy efficient as well. She knows what she'd like to do. Catherine Fife. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Obviously, uh, historical and heritage buildings bring so much uh, to the community, and this this community is rich in that regard. And, and we have some local advocates, actually, who have been quite vocal, which is great. Uh, my commitment would be to take that same, um, uh, you know, commitment to maintaining heritage and historical sites uh, within their community. The energy retrofit program is it can, needs to be part of that conversation, though. I mean, it, it has been cancelled. Uh, it's a lost opportunity, actually, for us to keep history alive and create jobs. And, and upgrade those buildings. And, uh, you know, that's a comprehensive plan that needs to be put forward. It requires provincial leadership and it requires municipal leadership, and that's part of the equation. And it requires funds, and that's not part of our equation. <laughs> There's the provincial leadership and municipal working together to preserve and save and upgrade. Thank you. As some of you may know, I, I'm by training a municipal and planning law lawyer, so I actually deal with heritage issues on a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. And I can say that I feel passionately about protect, protecting our heritage buildings. Oh. It's really important he to remember the history 
of our community Remember. and to make sure that, that history is reflected. That's why I think there's a number of great projects in Waterloo Region that you can point to where they preserved heritage structures instead of instead of just tearing them down. And we need to encourage more of that. We need to encourage municipalities to yes. designate we buildings of heritage significance um, and to make sure that they're protected uh, for future generations. Because there are a number of important historical buildings locally that we need to protect and that really deserve a great deal of heritage protection. But let me tell you this, I am a huge fan of protecting our heritage buildings and want to make sure that we provide municipalities and the Ontario Heritage Trust with the tools necessary to protect our heritage buildings. That's what he wants, what we need. Tracy Weiler. I think protecting heritage and cultural knowledge um, in our knowledge economy is really important. Um, as a, a person going That's through university, I had the opportunity to work at a provincial park um, that had a heritage building within it that was built in uh, 1849 oh. and really shared um, the knowledge about the cultural fabric and the social fabric of the area at the time. And I think that's important for future generations to learn. And I had the opportunity for about six years to tour people around explaining about that. So I think it is really important that we keep that knowledge because knowledge for future generations makes us appreciate the social and cultural fabric, fabric of the world that we live in. I think that knowledge um, is related important. to the energy retrofit program, one of the things that we always want to do is balance it with affordable energy for individuals and businesses, um, for businesses That's especially so that we can help ensure their competitiveness. Ah, she wants to ensure. Sure. This is Adam from Waterloo with a question about post-secondary education and tuition. Tuition. Got no I'm money. I'm with the Federation of Students, the Undergraduate Student Union at Waterloo. Um, at both universities in our community, students pay for more than 50% of the cost of their education through both tuition and fees. With the Ontario Tuition Framework up for renewal this year, what strategies will you and or your party use, not what have you done, what will you do, that ensures post-secondary education becomes affordable without compromising the funding necessary to ensure high quality. <laughs> Thank you. Good one. What's going to make education now, affordable and not Thank have you very an much for the question. And I've been knocking a lot of doors yeah. uh, over Tell us the last what they say. weeks and talking to many students who what have you heard? Uh, the rising cost of tuition Things is are bad. I mean, they've gone to part-time status. Sometimes they've yes. dropped out, and, oh. and it's such a it's such a loss of potential oh, yes. for our entire community. Yes, yes. Uh, the tuition a tuition freeze is certainly ah. on the table. I mean, we have to have it's an honest conversate. conversation oh, about the rising cost of post-secondary. <laughs> Uh, you know, giving a, a tuition rebate and grants and credits as the cost of tuition goes up is, is meaningless because that cost keeps going up. We have one of the highest uh, tuition oh, rates in the moment in the entire country. And, uh, you know, I, I'm surprised actually that the students haven't risen up uh, as they have in other parts because, uh, because you know, there's been a lot of promises on this mandate. There's been a lot of promises on this portfolio that have not been kept. And so uh, so that's our commitment, is to work with the student unions and to hold on uh, the tuition rates. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Soft Eric, your ability to get post-secondary education should not be based on affordability, but rather on your academic ability. Yeah, that's what should not be based on, yeah. And the Liberal government has done a great deal to make, to make post-secondary education more accessible, from reforming the OSAP What's a great system deal? to the 30% tuition grant. And we're, pl we're pledged to con continuing with the 30% tuition grant, because it's important to make sure that post-secondary education is accessible. That's important. I can speak from experience. I'm a Laurier grad here, um, and I've gone through seven years of post-secondary education and encountered a, a fair-sized student debt as a result. But what we need to do is we need to make sure that students who graduate now are not are not left with significant debt burdens. We need to make sure that yeah, post-secondary education, yeah. both at the university and the college level, remains accessible. That's important not just not just for them, but for Ontario's future, because in order to compete in the global economy, yeah. we need to make sure we have a highly yeah. skilled and highly educated workforce. Yeah, we do need workforce. to, yeah. That's important. We need to. Tracy Wilder. Goals, goals, goals. Post-secondary education is something um, pretty near and dear to my heart, oh, being yeah. an instructor in uh, Wilfrid Laurier Good today. Stuff. 
I believe in affordable quality education. I believe. And it was quite refreshing to see I that young good. student leaders from both the University of Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier took the time to come out and meet with uh, the various candidates over the last couple of weeks to share their ideas, their viewpoints, and their needs. With the candidates, we don't have any ideas or viewpoints. With their challenges in post-secondary education. And they were focused on not only affordable education, oh, but also quality education. Ah, both. We have the highest tuition in Ontario, in Canada. We have the lowest per student funding. And here we have another example of a McGinty broken promise where they said they wouldn't rise tuition prices and tuition rose by 30%. We need to be committed to quality, yeah. affordable education need, yes. so our students can have yeah. a good start in our world. We need to be committed. This idea is very fresh in my mind because I am currently paying back my student loans, so I, I appreciate how much it costs. Um, so what we would like to do in the Green Party, oh, yeah, like um, as Tracy acknowledged already, we have the highest rates in Canada, and so we would like to roll back our rates uh, within the next three years to Wouldn't the average nice? rate in Canada. Well, she likes um, so many nice things. Savings to those students, and then we need to tie yeah, those rates. To, yes. Any rises that we have in the future yeah. should be tied to inflation, so that we don't get these wild swings. And further, we need to make sure that we're we investing that in quality education. We need to ensure that the university has the funding that it needs so it doesn't have to rely so heavily on those tuition yes. rates. That's what we would like to see happen. Yeah, we'd like that, all right. Thank you. Perhaps, sir, another question from the audience, please. We have Jason from Kitchener asking about research and innovation. Research. No money. The uh, candidates may be aware of the Guelph Turfgrass Institute, where researchers are discovering key answers on biofuels, pesticides, and much more. And uh, I'd like to know each candidate's perspective on the current plan to replace that research facility with thousands of homes and commercial development. I'd like to know what you would do to protect that Ontario-owned research station, and uh, not just as land, but as the laboratory it truly is. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with that particular issue. Um, respectfully, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean. Um, I'll have to look into it and get back to you. My apologies. I don't. Uh, I'm just not familiar with that issue. I think that um, research institutions are pretty critical in our knowledge-based economy. They're important. Yes. Um, yes. I don't know much about uh, the particular institution that you're referring to, but if I take a step back and I look at the critical nature of research and development in Canada, it is what had has what kept us as uh, leading economies wow, wow, wow. in the world and is one of the key indicators that has helped us weather the global economic storm. So research into, and development into that type of innovative thinking is certainly something that falls very nicely into the Green Party platform. She likes that. Unfortunately, I, I'm not aware either of that uh, particular issue, but it's something that obviously needs to be talked about um, between the municipality and, and the government to see what, what type of agreement they can come up with. Um, I'm a social researcher by trade, and uh, you know it, it would be amazing if governments would recognize the uh, the importance of research and development. Imagine if someone had done some research about how to design the interior of an orange helicopter so that paramedics could actually do, you know, CPR. I mean, you know, public public policy public policy needs research. It shouldn't just come out from some of the back room boys who, who come up with an idea. And you know, it is a disturbing trend because more governments are moving away from research and development. The Harper government is a perfect example from an environmental perspective. You know, if you don't know how to, if you don't have the knowledge, you can't address the issue, you can't address the problem. And so uh, we, we are fully committed to research and development and it's one of the key philosophies as we develop our own policies as a political party to represent the people that we serve. Thank you. Committed to acquiring knowledge. Thank you. My question is um, specifically for Ms. Weiler, but if any of the, the other candidates want to answer it, it would be great. Um, I'm a student at the University of Waterloo, and this year um, I'm benefiting from the 30% tuition grant, and I had heard that the Bureaucracy called it a frow, 
and I was wondering what Ms. Weiler had to say about supporting the grant and struggling students. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that we always need to be looking at ways to support always need to be looking. receive affordable and quality education. Uh, yes, yes. Um, our party has looked looking. at a number of ideas, and uh -huh. we think that we need to be able to look mm, at yes. rising tuition costs. We need to um, look at. I think the 30% tuition grant is something that probably wouldn't have been needed had the Liberal government not raised tuition costs by 30%. Um, I do think that education is critical. I do wow. think that um, we are facing a situation where unemployment no. for students has topped uh, 15 percent wow. in Ontario. It that. is higher than the national average. Wow. So taking a step back, we need to look we at need. avenues for creating jobs for we young need students to look as for they come out of university. Jobs. Yes, sir. She knows we need to look. Okay, th thanks. Um, I'll extend the question to the other candidates. Stacy Danker. She needs to look so, too. Of course, the tuition grants are a great opportunity for us to help the students who, who need that type of support so that we can have students who don't necessarily have the type of resources available to them to attend university. Uh, and one of the things in talking with students um, that I found oh, was that those, those grants appear to only be available to non-professional students. So if you're, if you're in for medical school or engineering, then and they aren't available, and I think that they should be universally available to uh, to the students uh, who need them. Should be. Should be. Catherine Fife. Thank you. Actually, Stacy has referenced my point. Uh, I was knocking on the door and talked to a pharmacy, a uh, second-year pharmacy student recently, and uh, wow. she she doesn't qualify. I mean, we need pharmacists. We need yeah, doctors. We need. That's one of the yeah. reasons that we have a strategy in place. Oh. Uh, to uh, forgive the doctors in underserviced areas. 20,000 people in this riding, in this area, do not have access to a family doctor. I mean, what on the ground you need a plan, and clearly post-secondary is, is a big part of that. Uh, but it also is. I mean, the tuition discussion post-secondary is tied to jobs, because I'm talking to many parents and students who graduate into you know, part-time employment. The jobs are done there, which is why Look our job jobs. creator tax credit, specifically aimed at small and medium-sized enterprises, needs to happen. And that can well, happen in a minority happen. government setting. The 30% tuition grant has helped make post-secondary education, both the university and colleges, more accessible for people who want to get a post-secondary education. No kidding! But let's remember the Hudak PC oh, record on Hudak education. Hudak bad! They want to scrap the 30% tuition grant. They also want to eliminate full-day kindergarten. If elected, they're committed to firing thousands of teachers and further destabilizing our school system. And you have to ask yourself, are those the values that you share? Are, are, are those the values that you want to represent our community? We're fortunate in Kitchener-Waterloo to benefit from two, uh, from two universities, Wilfrid Laurier University of Waterloo and Conestoga College campus, right here in the riding of Kitchener-Waterloo. And we understand as a community the importance of higher learning. And we need to oh, promote yes. education in Ontario, not scrap it. Need to promote it, not scrap Okay, it. thank you. Um, I realize that there are still a good. lot of people with Vote for me. questions, and I'm sure. Um, I guess oh, we've like got a small wind turbine on the roof. Each of the candidates, but uh, it's been well documented uh, how the construction of industrial wind turbines is tearing apart the fabric of uh, rural Ontario, hitting neighbor against neighbor and even family members against each other. Uh, Premier McGinty was recently on the record it? in Belleville. Uh, saying that he doesn't need the headaches of them going into communities where they are wanted and for that reason there was a survey conducted in my area which is the receptor or a proposed receptor of a wind turbine project. My question to you is, is that as an elected official would you work on behalf of your constituents or toe the party line if clearly wow. and overwhelmingly the majority of, community, of the community that you represent for valid reasons rejected wind turbines? Because in our survey, 96% of the respondents from 610 households 
rejected the proposal. Okay. So they're complaining about either a dirty environment or they're com and they're going to end up using oil. Uh, the introduction Why can't we stick it in the and, north? And the FIT program to to help uh, invigorate that the renewable industry is is one that we think is a great industry to have in this region, uh, and and one that we generally support. The problem is that the way that it was actually introduced means that corporations are coming in, uh, usually international corporations coming in, and, and buying land and placing those uh, wind turbines. In, we have to look to better examples we like that in, in uh, our Dutch examples, where if you actually give local ownership and local decision making to where those those turbines are being placed, and that means that there's some value coming back into the community uh, from those placements themselves, the communities start to actually accept uh, and bring them into their communities. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the question. I mean, the key piece in, in having conversations around wind turbines or any actually green energy options uh, has to do with consultation. Consultation, and communication. conversation. And certainly we can learn a lot from our uh, examples in Europe, and we should. We should look to successful communities Talking solves all problems. Uh, green energy options like wind, tur wind turbines. Certainly our perspective though as a party is that we respect the local autonomy of the municipalities. So when those municipalities take ownership and, and accepting of wind turbines, uh, then you clearly have community buy-in. But as you pointed out, if you have a survey that says people don't want it, then it's then it's not that's not the appropriate place for it. So uh, definitely, we're respectful of the municipalities and their local autonomy, and consultation first, not after the fact. I'm very proud of our record on. He's always proud, isn't he? And on investing in clean green. Here's where we spent some money. Ontario is a world leader in investing in green technology, <laughs> and it is creating tens of thousands of jobs right here in Ontario. And that's Not a world leader in green technology, but a world leader in investing in green technology. It's really important. Interesting because we need to make sure we need that to make we sure have we need. cleaner sources of energy. Yes. And one of the ways we're doing that is we're also phasing out coal. We have phased out 90% of coal here in Ontario, and we're committed to eliminating coal in Ontario by 2014. Why? Plants love CO2. I think that um, we all know that renewable energy is good for Ontario and good for the environment. All right, we all know but that, But what yeah. we can't afford what? is wind energy programs uh, that come at the expense of it. consumers individual families and businesses in Ontario their ability to pay it. Ah. I spoke just to give you... Um, we need it, but not if we can't afford it. I spoke with somebody who is scared every month to open their electricity bill, oh. bill because they have no idea of how much it's going to be. So when we look at Ontario families Horror. and them trying to budget oh. for the sake of their families, yes. they're providing a very difficult situation for individuals to be able to afford, yes. to be able to afford the things that are important to them. Things are bad, she knows. Thanks again to everybody for including me in this great debate. I hope that um, in discussing all of these really important issues, you guys have been able to gather um, some information about who we are as candidates and what we stand for. And I hope you That's right. Thank you for including me and not excluding me with the other little guys so you can find out about me like you didn't find out about the other little guys. You continue that quest. Uh, of course, we've got lots of information available through platforms and policies. Oh, policies um, and and the policies of the Green Party of Ontario and that I agree with really promote the idea of vibrant local economies, uh, vibrancy, a strong needed. and fair education system, Strength, secure health care that, yes. that focuses on health promotion. Yes. And underlying all of those policies is an idea about sustainability yes. and fiscal responsibility. Nice words. And it's really that type of forward thinking that allows us to create plans that that 
really look for long term. What we're thinking allows us to create plans. That aren't just short term and created one recently <laughs> to the next, through the next electoral cycle. Uh, and I think that today we have to be thinking that finally we, we have, have a real alternative to the status quo. Okay. That is backbenchers that vote along party lines. It's time that we start thinking about voting for a Green MPP to represent the values and the needs and desires of the people within this community. This is a community that I truly love and I want to see it prosper and develop. She and, wants nice uh, things. As, as your MPP, I commit to you that I would do my utmost to make sure that Thank our voice is heard strong. In strong Queen's voice. Park. Ouch! We're broke! Help! Help! Strong voice! Help! Help! Thank you. No money! Help! Tracy Wild. Strong voice. Well, first I'd like to thank the record for organizing tonight's forum. And I thank, uh, I'd like to thank you all for I wish someone else had organized participating it. in our dialogue and discussion. Um, I think it's important that we all contribute What's to the democratic important? process. Except the guys who've been excluded. Everyone has heard this evening, Ontario is in trouble. Ooh. And we're in a pretty deep financial hole. And one of the things that has impressed me about the Progressive Conservative Party, My party. is not only do we recognize that there is a problem, but we also put forward a bold plan for <laughs> solutions for how we can turn Ontario's economy around. I hasn't explained how it works yet. We know that Ontario's jobs and debt crisis yes. is the direct result yes. of nine years of failed economic policies. Well, your years when too, When governments you know. choose to spend carelessly and deliberately mortgage our children's future, like you did too, Ontario <laughs> becomes unable to invest in priority areas, critical services, like health care and education. Just like when the Tories but were in charge. But my message here tonight is simple. There is a better way. Our old the way. the only party with a plan <laughs> to a return plan. Ontario to prosperity by focusing on growing our economy, creating uh, focusing jobs, on growing. and stopping the current government's uh, overspending jobs. and waste. We have all been fortunate to have been represented for 22 years by Ontario PC MPP Elizabeth Whitmer. She set the standard and the community deserves no less. I will leave you tonight with one solemn pledge. Should Do your you vote for me in this upcoming by-election, I promise yes. to work as hard for hard. you with as much integrity, accountability, and respect Looking for as answers. Elizabeth Whitmer did for the past 22 years. I'm not finding Thank any. You. Eric Davis, I'd like to thank the record for organizing tonight's debate. I don't. I'd like to thank you all very much for coming out and participating. It's important Democracy. to engage in your democratic process. Yes. And I thank you all very much for doing so. <laughs> this election... After such a travesty for him to go on lauding the democratic process, what a joke, eh? is all about values. Yeah. And you're and you stink. have to ask yourself the question, what do you value? Let Democracy. <laughs> I do not believe that the answers to today's problems ah, lie at either end of the political spectrum. What he doesn't believe. I believe that today it's important to have balance and compromise. And that's what those are the values that I see reflected in the Liberal Party. I want to represent the moderate and progressive values of our community and make sure that those values are represented responsibly at Queen's Park. The McGinty Liberal government has a plan for Ontario. We have a plan to protect the gains we've made in health care and education protect since games. 2003 while making sure that we making balance sure. the budget by 2017-2018. The PCs would say that we're not going far enough, that we should that we should get rid of full day kindergarten, oh, we should fire it, teachers, though. we should get rid of nurses, and we should have across the board cuts. The NDP, on the other hand, are basically making spending promises in the amounts of hundreds of millions of dollars. That's a reckless approach for the PCs, and that's a hundreds irresponsible of approach for the Democrats. Dimes, what we're adopting, what we're proposing, is a middle of the road approach, a balanced approach 
that sets up Ontario families for success. Oh, and that's set the up for success! That I want to represent and bring <laughs> to Queen's Park. Kitchener Waterloo deserves a strong voice in the government caucus. Yes, and I will strong voice. voice. I have one. And let me also make a, a pledge to you all tonight. Yeah. I will work hard for this community. I love this community, and I will represent it with all the integrity and responsibility that oh. I can I, I, if elected on September 6th. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I want to thank um, my uh, fellow colleagues up here on the panel. It takes a lot of courage to put your name on a ballot and stand up for what you believe in. And I want to thank them for their, for their involvement in this by-election. I just want to thank you. I mean, it's uh, you know, these are opportunities for us to learn and to listen and to grow. And certainly that has been my experience as I've served this community for nine years as a trustee and as chair of the board, as president of all the school boards in the province of Ontario. I mean, those are experiences that, you know, Elizabeth Whitmer experienced as well. And there's, there is a benefit to it because you learn and you understand that politics is about building relationships. It's about cro working with various well, it's about, It's about yes. putting the interests of the community that you serve ahead of your own. Uh, make no mistake about it, though. The education crisis that is dominating the media right now is all about a distraction. We did not talk about Orange. We did not talk about e-health. We did not talk extensively about, extensively about the cancellation of gas plants uh, in, in Oakville. We don't even know the price tag for the one in Oakville. Um, and, and, and so where we are is that we have a minority government and we have the opportunity to provide balance at Queen's Park oh. and to provide leadership because politics can be different. And what happens in Kitchener-Waterloo affects the entire province. Make no mistake about that. So my commitment to you oh. is to bring the knowledge that I have acquired. I mean, you have educated me. Bring her knowledge to Queen's Park to and, look for solutions. The integrity and knowledge that I can bring to Queen's Park means that I can get to work right away on okay. behalf of this riding. Yes. You need a champion, you need an advocate, and I want to be that person for you. No. So I respectfully ask for your vote on September 6th. Thank you very much. Well, this brings to a close um, our election form um, for the riding of Kitchener Waterloo. You crooked election forum, John Rowe. Over time, but I'd like to take just a few seconds to thank everybody in the live, online, and listening audience for being part of this evening's proceedings. I'd also Undemocratic like proceedings. to thank the candidates. Um, who are here tonight. Um, they, they've been answering questions for about two hours. Yeah. So I, I think they do deserve oh, a round yeah. of applause. Give them a hand, getting all that free publicity. So, good night, and thanks for joining us again. What I enjoy doing after political meetings is asking people as they're exiting, can you remember one thing that one of the candidates said? And because it's all rhetoric, oh, we should have this, we should have that, we shouldn't do this, I believe this, I love that, they're all in favor of good, they're all against bad, whatever going in, without ever going into details, it's so pure political rhetoric that most people can't remember one thing that they said. So I challenge you right now. Sit down with a piece of paper for one minute, and I want you to write down what the Liberal said that impressed you, what the Tory, what the NDP, and what the Greens said that impressed you, and you're going to realize not one of them said anything that impressed you for two hours. Not one thing you could remember they said of value. Oh, maybe a tax cut here and there, but most people won't remember those because they heard them so often. So, John the Engineer, tuning out. So that was the first crooked meeting organized by the record and moderated by John Rowe, the reporter. And uh, so, what can I say? The police had to be called to remove me. The other five candidates sat in the audience and watched themselves be cheated. I don't. Anytime they open something for the public where my opponents get to score points, I'm showing up. And if it's going to take cops to take me away, it always will.